Josh Royland is an assistant professor, CLAS Honors Preceptor of Journalism in the Department of Communication and Journalism and the Honors College at the University of Maine. He has a PhD in American Studies from St. Louis University and is a cultural historian of the American news media with a specific focus on literary journalism and the nonfiction of David Foster Wallace, who we'll be talking about today. Please welcome Josh. For me, the sound of anxiety is silence. It's an empty room where I sit, alone, and all I can hear are my thoughts that quietly insist themselves upon me, both unbidden and unwelcome. And after a time, a time in which I get up and I walk through other empty rooms only to return, and get up and return, those thoughts begin to take the same shape as that recursive path through my apartment, looping endlessly, relentlessly. And so the question becomes how to cut the circuit. And so for the writer, David Foster Wallace, the answer was fiction. Fiction, he said, made us feel less alone. Fiction was about, quote, what it is to be a fucking human being, as terrifying as that existence was at times for him. Wallace published his first novel soon after graduating from Amherst College. He produced a collection of short stories shortly thereafter. At age 34, he uh, published a novel, uh, Infinite Jest. 1,079 pages, uh, Infinite Jest is this magnum work about uh, addiction, entertainment, and happiness in America. He was given a MacArthur Genius Grant and was considered by many to be the greatest American writer of his generation. And then, on a warm September evening in 2008, Wallace went into the backyard of his home in Claremont, California, and hanged himself. His death knocked many worlds out of orbit, including my own. Here you see his widow, uh, Karen Green, expressing her grief in collage and in text. Obituaries well, followed after uh, his death. This one by David Lipsky in Rolling Stone, another one by D.T. Max in the New Yorker magazine. These obituaries showed that Wallace had suffered from clinical depression for more than 20 years and that a recent medication switch was likely responsible for his, his downward spiral. And it's perhaps too easy now to go back and look and see all of the anxiety and depression in his work. But it's hard to watch this 1997 interview with Charlie Rose and not feel uncomfortable every time you see Wallace wince after giving actually a really thoughtful and brilliant answer. And so my own interest in Wallace uh, began with his magazine journalism. You can see here, Consider the Lobster, uh, about the Maine Lobster Festival. Um, the best way, I think, to understand Wallace's journalism is to think of it as consciousness on the page. And Wallace was awash in this consciousness, and it made him such a great journalist. Uh, he, he was compelled to, to be curious and chronicle everything he saw. Um, so as cliche as it, as it sounds, for me, the way to process Wallace's death was to write about it. But that was actually difficult. Um, the work only intensified my feelings, amplified my anxiety. To spend time in his head, to see his thoughts scribbled all over the page, to see the self-loathing that's evident in his journals uh, was difficult. It was difficult. But I produced an article out of, out of this work um, saying that Wallace lacked what Nietzsche calls uh, oblivion, this active screening uh, device that uh, is responsible for closing off the doors of consciousness and uh, giving us a little bit of peace. <laughs> and as I was working on this first article and thinking about Nietzsche and oblivion, I realized that I lacked that concierge as well. Uh, and so it was, it was a difficult thing to write. But, and I realized then, and I know now that that first article was a projection. I was projecting my own feelings onto Wallace, and it just so happened that they mapped uh, and lined up pretty well. Still, uh, the piece garnered some attention, which was kind of cool. Uh, I ended up in this book, uh, somehow in Congress, then between Don DeLillo and George Saunders, which initially was cool, and then it became horrifying. I was a graduate student, and I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, I had no self-confidence. I worried about uh, later days when I, when I couldn't write after this. I worried this was it. This was going to be the high point. I began to feel like the character in Good Old Neon, the narrator who says, my whole life I've been a fraud. 
I'm not exaggerating, pretty much all I've ever done all the time is to try and create a certain impression of me and other people. Mostly to be liked or admired. It's a little more complicated than that. Maybe. And so I understand that these aren't good thoughts, healthy thoughts. I've seen therapists, I've been on medication. Some of it's helped, some of it hasn't. Uh, I can still be the dynamic uh, high wattage professor racing around the classroom or all the friends and then go home to those same silent, empty rooms. Through it all, I continue to write about Wallace as a way to help myself. Uh, last year, I published another piece uh, that got republished by Longreads, and it got this uh, one of their ten most popular exclusives of last year, which was neat, and then all of a sudden I thought, now what? Now what do I need to do? And so it's always fleeting. That feeling's always fleeting. Last summer, I spent a month going through Wallace's archives at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas. It was neat and it was scary. It was uh, the largeness of the archive, the sadness of the contents, uh, the isolation of being in a town where you don't know anybody. Anyway. And then on my first day there, I get an email from D.T. Max, the New Yorker writer who turned out to be Wallace's biographer. He said he wanted to talk about my article, and we talked for 90 minutes later on that week. And it was mostly cordial, but he made it clear that he wasn't happy with my criticisms of his book in my article. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can imagine what that kind of did to me. I'm already kind of reeling a little bit, and then this first week I have a New Yorker writer telling me how bad I am. <laughs> Wallace himself provided an antidote, if only in words, to some of these feelings. Uh, he gave a, a commencement address to Kenyon College in 2005 and about the value of a liberal arts degree, about it's giving you options for what to think about, how to be well adjusted. But he admitted that it's unimaginably hard to do this day in and day out. And so this summer, I'm returning back to Austin to continue researching my book on Wallace, and I'm fully aware of the dread that's awaiting me there. <laughs> The paralyzing panic attacks, Saturdays, slump, sobbing. And so, while one part of me is excited to continue this writing, there remains a voice inside that continues to repeat these last lines. The realer, more enduring and sentimental part of him, commanding that other part to be silent, as if looking at lovely in the eye and saying, almost aloud, not another word. <laughs> <laughs>